So, good morning, church. Uh, morning, we're taking it back to the beginning, Genesis 1. Uh, if you want to read with me, we're reading from verse 26 to 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and, all, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Thank you. Awesome, deal. Thanks for that. All right. Just need to get my notes up here. Yeah, so we're, we are taking it right back to the beginning, and thanks to Dill for that Bible reading, and, and thanks for the, the worship team. That was, I was super encouraged with, with you guys today, um, especially you, Jelly, just getting up there, and it was, it was great, awesome. But there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, we, we're doing this series of this idea of, of priestly that we are all, you know, sometimes you might think, oh, Ken's the leader of the church or whatever, and so he's the priest, he's the guy, or, or if you're the person with the, the stiff collar, then, you know, in the Catholic church or the Anglican church, and you're priest. Actually, I'm, I'm wanting to do this series to recapture the idea that all human beings are priests. That priests are the people who stand in between two parties or two places or two, or two people or, or two spaces. And, and, and priests are always representing, they're always representing one group of people to another group of people. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a timely topic at the moment. Because there's a lot of representation taking place right now. Who can think of maybe a global event where people are representing a whole bunch of other people? The Olympics, absolutely. So we've got, I know, I noticed in my uh, Facebook timeline that uh, the Philippines had won their first gold medal at the Olympics. Now, do, now, now we have some Filipinos here. Like, none of you guys went to the Olympics, right? But no, no, none of you guys. But, but you feel represented, you feel seen, you feel proud of what's taking place. I know, I've, I've been quite, you know, I'm, I'm very unfit, I'm not very sporty or anything like that, but I, I'm, I'm quite uh, proud of what Australia is doing at the Olympics. And so what's happening is that um, the best athletes around the world are representing their countries. And it's huge, right? In fact, you could argue, it's, it's not just the Olympics though, but that's a, a timely example or picture. But in fact, you could argue that, that, that that as human beings, we're always representing something greater than ourselves, all the time. We're always representing, we're always repping. It, it might not be something that we ask for, and it might not even be fair of, what, of how people look at us and, and who we're representing. But nonetheless, right or wrong, fair or not, we're always representing. And people will put, the, put us either in a box or they'll label us. And they'll even judge us, like I said, rightly or wrongly, but we are always representing. For instance, my kids. My kids are always representing me. My kids are all, always representing my parenting. People are going to look at my kids, maybe in their, their best moments, and think, oh, wow, Ken's such a good father. And, or that, then they might see my kids in their worst moments and think, oh, Ken is such a bad father. You know, whether that's right or wrong, they're representing me. They're representing my parenting. They represent the school that they go to. They represent the suburb that they live in, that they've grown up in. They represent their ethnic heritage. They're, we worked it out that they are five-eighths kind of English, one-quarter Chinese, and one-eighth German. So they're, they're representing that mix, right, because of, of their ethnic heritage. There's, there's always someone who you are representing. You're representing someone or you're representing something. That's just what it, that's what it is to me, means to be human. But, but, but really, and ultimately, and deeply, that's what it means to be human. As we've seen in Genesis 1, verse 26 to 27. I'm just going to read it out again. Um, just to drill it home. Then God said, let us make mankind or humanity, let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. 
You know, over maybe the past year, I've kept coming back to these verses. We did a series on identity about what it means to be human. We hit these verses, right? These are key verses. And, and Kira even referenced it when she was talking about our story. We have a story that we believe in. All, all humans have a story to process how, how to make sense of the world. We as Christians have a story and it starts right here at the beginning. We keep coming back to this idea that we are created, that we're made in God's image. That's why we have value. That's why humans are different to animals. We love animals. We're meant to look after them, meant to take care of them, meant to, uh, you know, promote their welfare. But humans are different to animals because of the image of God. We are meant to represent Him. I.e., we're meant to be priests for Him. At Genesis, we come the beginning of our story. To be human means, in a very real way, that we, all of us, are priests. We are created with this intention and continually called to be representatives of God. Not just me, not just Kira, not just people that we put the title pastor or reverend in front of, but each and every single one, each and every single one of you. I'm looking at you. Out there in Facebook land, I'm looking at you guys. All of us are priests. All of us have the image of God. All of us are called to cultivate this world that we're in and bring the best out of it for the benefit of everyone. We are, to be human means in a very real real way, we are priests. We're standing between. Last week we saw how priests during a pandemic in in the Hebrew Bible time, the book of Exodus, the priests stood between the living and the dead. And that's kind of what we're called to do. We stand between. And, and now, all of us as humans, we're called to stand between God and the rest of creation. To represent God. To represent, but to represent. Here is God. God is, is, is he's here, but I'm presenting him again to you, to the rest of creation. And as Kira was saying, in our story, it means what it means to be human, made in the image of God, made to be priest of God is that we are cultivating the potential out of the world, out of creation, for the glory of God, to bring it back and to present it back to Him. So there's this two-way connection in terms of what it means to be human. That I represent God to the world, and then I represent the world back to God. So, if if that's... If the Christian story is true then to flourish as humans, which is to say to flourish as priests, we are called to spend time with God. We're called to represent parties, right? If you're a lawyer representing your client, you need to know what your client wants. If we are priests representing God, we need to know who God is and what he's like, what his character is like. Who knows, there's, there's a whole bunch of like angry, judgmental Christians out there representing God maybe the wrong way. Is God angry and judgmental? Or is he loving and gracious? So to represent God correctly, we need to spend time with God, right? We, we kind of all know that. We're told that. That's kind of the default thing that we're told in church. Spend time with God. Read your Bible. Pray. We're, 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 we're told to do that. That's what good Christians do. Um, but it, there's a problem with that. If, we, if I just tell you to read your Bible and pray, then that can become very legalistic. That can become very much performance. We sing a song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. How many times have we done? Have we sung songs just because that's what you're meant to do, as opposed to going back to the heart of worship, the heart of intimacy with God? So, you know, why why do why are we told as Christians to read our Bible to pray every day? Is it so that we stop sinning? Is it so that we can be more successful? Is that we can be more loved by God? None of those things are true. None of those are correct. Actually, you know, I'm not even, I don't even want to tell you to read your Bible to pray every day. What I do want to tell you is to meet with God. Meet with God and know God every day. Meet with God and know God every day. Perhaps reading my Bible is going to be really important in that. Perhaps praying and talking to God is going to be really important in that. I say, it is. But I'm wanting to reprioritize things. It's not about the things that we do. It's the goal. What's the goal? It's to know God. Why? Because I'm made in the image of God. I'm meant to represent Him. I'm a priest of God. Oh, you're a priest because you're a pastor. No, we're all priests, all humans. 
are called to represent him. That's an important distinction. Because if I just tell you to read your Bible and pray every day, then you can do that and never ever meet God. Because it's just another box to tick. But if I say, hey, you're a priest, and therefore you're meant to represent God, get to know God, spend time with God, well, how do I do that? You know, today that means I'm going to read my Bible and pray. Oh, tomorrow that means I'm going to take a hike down to Wilson's Prom and spend time with God there. So we kind of get that. We're, we're, we're meant to know God, right? But it's just as important. There's, there's a two-way street when it comes to being a priest. We stand between two parties. One party is... God, and the other party is the rest of creation, the rest of the world. We we forget that so often, and I'm here to remind you of it. I'm, I'm, in fact, I hope I'm here to blow your mind with this kind of concept. Because just as important in our priestly calling, which we all have, you have this. You, because you are a human being made in the image of God, you have this priestly calling. Just as important is to know creation. And as priests, we stand in between. I wonder how many Christians are not flourishing in their priestly role because they don't know that the world that they are in. Do you know the world that you're in? There's actually probably quite a lot that aren't flourishing in their priestly role because they don't know the world that they're in. In fact, many Christians are taught to be afraid of the world. Have you ever been taught to be afraid of the world? Many Christians are taught to hate the world. Many Christians are called to withdraw from the world. Many Christians are called, don't, who cares what's happening in the world? Let's just focus on what's happening in the church. Have you ever heard anything like that talked about? If you have, then you're probably in a place where people aren't really flourishing in their priestly role. Because to be a priest means that we represent two parties. And just as we are meant to know God, not just read our Bibles and pray, we do that for the goal of knowing God, of encountering God. But just as much as we need to do that, we need to know our world. Because we're meant to represent the world to God. How else are, are we meant to see what's broken be fixed, what is old be made new, be renewed? How can I cultivate the potential that God has placed all around me in Carlton, in South Yarra, in Mooney Pines? in your workplace? How am I meant to cultivate that potential that God has placed all around us if I approach it with a posture of fear or suspicion? Why is this important? To be a priest who knows both parties. To be a priest, we need to know both parties that we are meant to represent. We're meant to know God. We're meant to know the world. And what, but why is this important? Why am I talking about this? Ken, should we just be talking about how we're meant to know God? Yes, we are. Yes. But we're also meant to know the world because we're meant to represent the world to God. Why is this important? First of all, it makes our work meaningful. It makes our work sacred. It makes our work, it sacralizes our work. It takes it from being something that's just out there and secular. But your work can be just as important as this work I'm doing right now. What's the work I'm doing right now? I'm, I'm sharing the word, I'm teaching the word. And, oh yeah, of course that's important work, Ken, because that's spiritual work. No, your work, because you are a priest and you're meant to know your world and represent your world back to God, whatever work you're doing is priestly work. So so what kind of jobs do you guys do? Just shout it out. Building management. Building management. That is priestly work. You, you are meant to know the building and the people in that building and bring that and all its issues to God so that the people in that building and the building itself can be blessed. That is priestly work. You are in the image of God, representing God to that community and that community, including the building itself, back to God. Anyone else? And what else do you do? You do research? So you work in a hospital and you... You are you're, you're actually you're literally investigating creation and trying to work out how to fix things that are broken. That is absolutely priestly work. You work with a team, so there's people there that you uh, that you need to represent back to God, but also the work itself. God, this work that we're doing, we need some breakthrough in this work. We, we, this research that if, if we do get a breakthrough, it's going to help so many people. That is priestly work. It's not just me teaching the Bible. I mean, and that's what God's called me to do. 
But but it's what you what God's called you to do as well. Anyone else? One more. What was that? So you do robotics automation in for business systems. Okay, so you work with a team. So that's once if you're working with people, obviously you're you're a priest to them, you're representing God to them and, and, and them. And then other other is it anyone in your team have, have issues? Maybe they need help. Maybe they need some hope. Maybe they need some kind of joy and, and love in their life. And so obviously you can bring that, and you can bring their needs to God. But also the work itself that you do is that you do programming for ro- robotic, um, what's it? Again? Robotic automation. So you do programming for robotic automation, which then makes businesses become more efficient, able to um, you know make more money, and then use that money to invest and then improve people's lives and. So I mean that's that's also important work. Basically, you're like you're gardening in the area of business, and you're making things more efficient. It's like you know we all used it used to be that 90% of people their job was to make food to survive. 90% of people worked in agriculture. Now only 5% or less work in agriculture, and that's because of tractors and automation. And so what you're doing in the business world is you are basically building the tractors to make things more productive. And that, that's, that blesses everyone. So, it's important to understand that we are priests representing two parties. And just as important as it is to know God, we're meant to know our world, because that makes our work sacred. It makes our work priestly. You are called, not just me, we're all called to priestly work. It means that working hard and praying about how the kingdom of God looks in this field, whatever the field is, asking for insight and breakthrough for the glory of God, that's priestly work. It's just as important as knowing God. We represent God to the world and the world with all of its mess, with all of its brokenness, with all of its beauty and its potential. We represent it back to God. You represent the issues and the potential of the research lab. You represent the, the, the social dysfunction as well as the... Um, efficient performance of your work back to God to fix what's broken and to multiply what's what's healthy in your workplace. You're a priest, Melai. That's huge. So let me ask you this question. What work do you do? Maybe it's paid work. Maybe it's volunteer work. Maybe it's work at home. All of that's important. See, the work that God calls us to do is priestly work. Now, even if the world thinks it's, it's invaluable, Sometimes stay-at-home mums get treated like, oh, you know, they're second-class citizens. They're not really, they're wasting their education and that kind of stuff. Well, not in God's economy, because stay-at-home mums have a priestly role. All, all of our work can be, is important and can be priestly, but it requires people who will represent God to that work and that work back to God. Why else is it important to take our priestly identity seriously? Going back to the beginning of our story, going back to Genesis chapter 1, we're made in the image of God, meant to represent God to the rest of creation, creation back to God. Why else is that important? Well, why else is it important to take our priestly identity seriously? Because if we do that, if we, if we say, you know what, it's not just Ken who's a priest, even though he's just kind of wearing a cardigan and a, and a t-shirt and, not, and a pair of jeans and not what fancy priests wear. <laughs> It's not just Ken who's a priest. It's it's me. I am. What how else what else what other difference does that make? It makes our relationships like a garden. The garden that Adam was called to tend to and to to invest in and to fertilize and to prune and to bring forth fruit in the garden of Eden. The garden Eden means delights, the garden of delights. It makes our relationships a garden. Our relationships are like a garden. In any garden, we need to dig down deep and be present. It means that I can put down roots wherever I happen to be. Maybe I'm only there for three months. Maybe I'm there for six months. Maybe I'm there for 60 years. But I can put down roots. I can get to know my next door neighbours. I can get to know the the people who live in the same apartment complex as me. I can get to know my workmates, the barista at my favourite coffee shop. I can get to know my family members and spend time with them, the parents of the kids of the school that my children go to. All those are relationships that can be cultivated. Because I'm meant to know God, of course, right? That's, we, we know that as Christians. But I'm also meant to know 
this garden that God has placed me in, this garden of delights, this garden of Eden, these relationships, these relationships can become that garden. I mean, in the every nation world, we say relationship, sorry, we say that the discipleship is a relationship. Do we believe that? Sometimes I think the temptation can be we get so busy doing spiritual things. I'm, I'm too busy reading my Bible. I'm too busy praying. I'm too busy going to a prayer meeting. I'm too busy getting doing worship practice. I'm too busy doing all these things to actually spend time investing in the, the garden of relationships that God has given us. You know, we, we try to run a pretty lean ministry program in every nation building for the express purpose of releasing time so that we can invest in relationships in our lives. Relationships of people who don't know God. Why? Because we are all priests. So right now, Derek is, he's not here today, but he said, you know, Ken, I'm taking pub church to North Fitzroy. I'm meeting with other musos in a pub and we're, we're jamming together. And what Derek is doing right now is he is being a priest to those guys. You know what? A couple kilometers down the road at a pub in North Fitzroy. And, it's like, uh, and in my mind, it's like, well, do I say, no way, Derek, you've come to church in front of me. No, it's like, no, you're doing exactly what you're called to do. You are being a priest. Remember, this is what it means to be human. I'm like, do, do, you, do, you, do you want to feel a sense of joy and satisfaction in who you are? Then be truly a human. Be who God has made you to be. And he has made you to represent him. He's made you to be a priest, always repping God and representing this city, representing your friends, representing even your enemies, back to God. You know what? These people that I like, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing you to... Bring into you. I've spent time with them. I know them. I'm bringing to you the things that are in their lives. Oh God, these people at work who are giving me a hard time, they're like my enemies. But you know what? I'm still bringing them to you. I'm bringing you their issues. I'm bringing you their, um, I'm bringing you their needs. I'm representing my friends. I'm representing my enemies. I'm representing this city. I'm representing my classmates. I'm seeking their peace. I'm seeking their blessing. I'm seeking their flourishing. That's, that's what it means to be human. That's what it means to have the image of God fully restored in us. It means my work is important. It means my relationships are important. It means my relationship with God isn't just about ticking boxes, reading the Bible and praying. Why do I do that stuff? I do it so I know God. Why do I spend time? In, what, what can I do to make my time intentional in the workplace to get to know people? Remember, what are the two greatest commandments according to Jesus? The two. There's 613 in the... Love your neighbour as you love yourself. Yes. And then that's number two. But the first one is? Love God. Yes. Love the Lord your God. The greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind and strength. From Deuteronomy. And then the second is like it. Jesus says to love your neighbour as yourself. It's from Leviticus. From the book of Leviticus. Love your neighbour as yourself. Leviticus chapter 19. Two, uh, out of 613 commandments, those are the two greatest commandments. And what does that tell us? It shows the two parties. As a priest, we stand between. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Love your workmate. Love you. Doesn't mean doesn't mean your neighbour's your friend. It could be your neighbour's your enemy. But love them. Stand in between them. Represent them to each other. All right. Good stuff, Ken. Wrapping up here. Got some questions for some discussion. Have you represented your state or country in an event? Any 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 state reps here, national reps? We'll find out soon. Uh, have you thought about what other groups you represent? Who who do you represent? Do you have your thought? Who who am I representing here? Does that make a difference in the way that you live day to day? Why is it important to distinguish between doing Christian activities and knowing God more deeply? I've kind of talked about that a little bit, but maybe. Because it's always the trap is to fall into just going through the motions. How can you represent God in your work? How can you represent your work, your workplace, relationships and places to God? What would change if you saw yourself more as a priest standing between God and everyone and everything else? 
what would change? Okay, awesome guys.